So I want to tell you my story. The first thing I remember was what my mom would tell me when I was a little kid, way, way, way back. When I was coming out of a store with her or someplace in a parking lot, she would look at me and say, hey, get over here and hold my hand. I don't want you to get squished like a bug. Squished like a bug. I didn't know it at the time. I couldn't know it at the time. But the big piece of metal that was on top of me was part of the engine of a commercial airliner. My face was against the asphalt. My arms were spread out like a scarecrow. I couldn't move, but I could see. I had this little window of vision that I could see through the world. It's like a picture turned on its side. One of the first things I saw was the weirdest snowstorm I ever could imagine. It wasn't snow. It was paper blowing in the wind, and I remember watching one particular snowflake of paper get closer and closer and closer to me until it went right up against my face, which made me panic because I couldn't see. I decided I would blow it off, and I tried to take a breath. Tried. Whatever was on top of me did not move. Squished. Like a bug. All I could see was shadows passing on the other side of the paper. I started the day a few minutes late, um, which always makes me very agitated and angry. I am a punctual person. The reason I was late is because I was taking my daughter to school. She had uh, a, a library book that was overdue, and she had to go back inside the house. I went back in with her. We looked everywhere we could possibly look, only to have her mother find the the book right where she put it the night before in her book bag. I was angry. I was angry. I got to work 10 minutes late. But it's that 10 minutes that saved my life. Or at least for a little while. I couldn't help but at that moment, I don't know why, but I began to think about the, the baseball tickets that were in my pocket. Um... My boss had given them to everybody in our department uh, because we had sealed a deal, a big deal. I mean, a really big deal, a nine-figure deal. We were all going to get massive bonuses. And the boss said, hey, let's have a party too. Let's, let's go to the game together. I was going to be sure that I got my daughter uh, a team jersey because it was like jersey day the next day at school and I wanted to surprise her with a, a team jersey. I, I knew that she would love that. And at the thought of my daughter, I sighed. And that's when I felt the pain really for the first time. I'd broken a rib when I was in high school playing soccer and, and I remember how hard it was to breathe then. This was a thousand times worse. And, and, and then what, what made it even worse beyond that is that my tie was over my mouth, and, and I couldn't get it off. I, I, I wanted so desperately to, to, to get my arms, my hands free so that I could move that piece of paper that was over my eyes so that I could move my tie off my mouth and, and breathe. I felt, like, I felt like a butterfly in somebody's collection pinned to a piece of styrofoam. Seeing and breathing, two things you, you don't really miss until they're, they're gone. I was pinned down tight, but I wasn't crushed. And, and I started trying to move just to see what I could move. And I could wiggle my fingers. I discovered that my left hand was still gripping the handle of my briefcase. I, I, could, I could wiggle everything. Uh, um, I didn't know what to do next. I, I just started to think about how I got in this place and how it happened. And what I remember is that there was an explosion and I just reacted. And so I ducked behind a parked car 
And then pieces of concrete started falling out of the sky onto the street. Uh, huge pieces of concrete, huge pieces of glass. And then the big metal thing that was on top of me ricocheted off a building and landed right on top of me. The parked car I was hiding behind must have given me just enough space to survive. But I knew I couldn't survive long. I also knew that I wasn't the only one there. I could hear a woman screaming very near me, screaming in pain. I, I tried to call out to her and I tried to take a breath, but I couldn't. I couldn't. Not long after that, the screaming, the screaming stopped. A strange thought came into my mind at that point, and it was just to, to try all of my senses. I, I couldn't sniff because I couldn't really breathe, but I could smell. I could smell the street, and I could smell gasoline. I, I could feel in my right hand that there were some pebbles on the street, and I could, I could touch those and, and kind of roll them around. And it was about that time that a gust of wind came and, and moved the piece of paper just enough so that I could see out of one eye. I got a little glimpse, and, and the first thing I saw was a, a pair of high-heeled shoes on a pair of feet. I assumed it was from the woman, they were on the woman who I heard screaming earlier. I could hear sirens. I could hear boots clomping down the street, lots and lots of, of boots. And I knew the sound. I knew exactly what it was because I'd been to boot camp. I had, I had uh, served my time in the military, done a stint with the, with the army. And then the boots stopped. The boots stopped right in front of me. At the same time, another gust of wind came and blew the piece of paper completely off my face. And I could see there were many, many boots there. And I just had to cry out. I, I took in as big a breath as I could to shout, and I just felt all these needles of pain just go through my body. And I didn't even know if I blacked out or if I was able to say anything, but when I came to, it worked. There was a pair of boots right in front of me, and then somebody kneeled down right in front of me, and it was a firefighter, my new best friend. And he reached out, and he put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, just, just be still. Just stay right here. I'm going to call in your location. We are going to get you out of here. And, and I finally, in all of that churning, I finally felt a little bit of hope. I was going to go home. I was going to see my daughter again. I was going to see a baseball game again. Hope. It felt so good. He kept his hand on my shoulder that whole time. It was very reassuring. And then I felt the second explosion. The entire ground lifted and everything shook and the firefighter took his hand off my shoulder and, and I began to hear shouting, uh, someone else saying, we've got to get out of here, we've got to get out of here now. And, and then the firefighter leaned down so that I could see his face and he said, you're going to be okay. Uh, somebody is going to come take care of you. I just know it. Somebody will be here. Somebody. And then he he left. He left. He, the boots clomped off, and my hope clomped off with the boots. And then I got angry. I was so mad. How could they just leave me there? I was so angry, and I started to thrash around just to try and move whatever was on me to get it off. And all that did was send more pain through my body, flashes of pain that went right into my brain. And I just stopped, and then I started to cry. I was crying because of the pain, and I was crying because of the, the dead woman in front of me. I was crying because of the stupid argument that I'd had with my wife the night before. I really didn't know how much time passed after that. I just know that the dust got thicker and thicker and coated my eyes and my face and, and my throat. It was so scratchy and so dry, but I dare not try to cough. I just cried. I rarely show any emotion. I, I think that's part of why I'm so good at what I do, and I make a lot of money. It's how I, I earned the right to that corner office on the 73rd floor. I was lost in my thoughts about all of that. 
And so it literally scared me when a hand reached in and touched me. I can still remember the smell of that latex glove on that hand. And it reached in and it wiped some of the dust off my face and then it put two fingers next to my throat and then I heard the voice attached to the hand that said, we got a live one here. We've got a live one here. More boots clomping, more hands reaching in, uh, somebody opening up my eyelids and shining a light in. I, I could see that whoever this was was a paramedic and they were here to help me. Again, another best friend for the day. And then I heard somebody else say some of the worst words I could imagine. They said, he's alive, but we don't think we can get this off of him. Somebody said, we had to, we had to try. We've got to try and get this off of him. And somebody else said, by the time we got that off of him, we could have saved so many more people. We've got to move on. We've got to move on. We have to save the people we can save. Plus, this guy might have such internal injuries that we might get him out and he still might not make it. They were talking about me like I wasn't there. They were talking about me. They were talking about my life. They were talking about my wife and my, my daughter. They were talking about my future. Like I wasn't even there. This young paramedic knelt down in front of me. He said, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. He was crying too. And then they all left. At least I thought they did felt something, it was like somebody was holding my hand. And then they weren't holding my hand, they were compressing my hand. They were sliding something over my hand and onto my wrist, and then they were tightening something down. And then I heard another paramedic, a woman, say, I've tagged him, let's go. They had tagged me and left me for dead. started slipping in and out of consciousness. I, I'd hear footsteps coming close to me, but I knew as soon as they saw that tag on my wrist, they just kept on going. I, I tried to, to wiggle my fingers and get that. I tried to rub the, the edge of it on the, on the asphalt to try and break that, that damn tag off. But all that did was just waste my energy what little energy I had. I don't know how long I was out, but I was out for a while. The last time I woke up, there was some water being splashed on my face. And, and I, honestly, I, I woke up from that thinking, oh, it was all nightmare, and it's over. Just a bad dream, but it wasn't. I was still there, squished like a bug. I opened my eyes, and, and through the crust on them, I, I found myself staring into the ugliest face I had ever seen. Dirty, pockmarked, missing teeth, crazy hair. Didn't take me long to figure out it was one of those vile, homeless people that are around the entrance to our building, always begging, always stinking the place up. His breath near me, nearly knocked me back into unconsciousness when he got real close to me and he said, he said, good morning. Good morning, my good sir. Look at what the cat dragged in. I've seen some bad things today. You ain't the worst. I couldn't understand, really process what all was happening. I just remember him talking to himself nonstop, pouring water gently over my face, cleaning away the cake dirt with a rag that smelled like mildew. It was disgusting. He was pulling stuff out of a shopping cart. I could see the wheels of the shopping cart there in my field of vision. And he was talking crazy, just nonstop. I remember him saying something about a buddy of his, another soldier in Nam, who got hit, crushed by a helicopter, cut him in two. And he, and he he leans down to me and says, it took two body bags for him. You're only going to need one. And then he laughed and laughed and laughed at himself. I drew in what little breath I could and whispered two words. Water, please. 
he got up and went to his shopping cart. I could hear him rummaging around. He brought me a bottle of water and began to pour sips of that water into my mouth. He, he said, oh, you can drink as much as you want. They're giving it away for free. I got two cases. Yeah. Oh, and they're giving away free food too. I'm fat and happy today. Little sips of water. I got to tell you, I hadn't had anything to drink since my latte that morning. That tepid water was the best thing I have ever, ever had to drink. He sat down cross-legged in front of me. Like he was thinking about something. And, and he said something like this. Here's the situation, my friend. Old Joe here might be able to help you. Might not. What do you say we give it a try? He said, I got this crowbar. I carry it with me to ward off those punks that are always bugging me. Let's give it a try. And then he disappeared. And I got to be honest, there was this fear of him going away. That I might not see him again. And, and then I, I heard him saying something about making a fulcrum. And then he said something like this. You know, even an old scrawny feller like me can move a boulder if you get a good full crumb, this thing's just like one of them big boulders in, in Da Nang that I had to clear for that airstrip. And then I felt it happen. It started to move. And then the next thing I know, it came crashing off to the side of me. It was completely off of me. And old Joe just started laughing and hooting and hollering. And I started breathing. And I could feel life going back into my body. And old, old Joe leaned back down to me and he said, you and me, we got to get out of here. We got to get out of here fast. If the stuff falling won't kill us, this dust we're breathing sure will. And he reached down and he grabbed me under my arms and lifted me up and my legs gave out from underneath me. The pain was insane. But, but he held me up and he said, did you think you can walk out of here? We got to walk. We got to get out. I shook my head. I knew I couldn't take one step, let alone walk a half a mile or a mile. Again, that fear came through me like, he's going to leave me. Just like the others did, he's going to leave me. But instead, he, I don't even know how he did it. He just swept me into his arms, carried me over to that old shopping cart, and gently set me down in it. It wasn't very dignified. My legs were hanging over the sides, and my arms were hanging over the sides. And then old Joe found this blanket in the midst of all his stuff and, and wrapped me up in it like a baby about to go on a long car ride. And he guided that shopping cart around all the rubble and headed toward the river, headed toward the bridge. And after a few blocks, we merged into this stream of people, all of them shell-shocked. And a homeless guy pushing a cart with a Wall Street banker in it was not the strangest thing that day. And there were construction workers. There were hipsters. There were people with their pets in cages. There were whole families in their pajamas. Everybody covered in that horrible dust. Everybody crossing that bridge in silence when we got to it. About halfway across the bridge, I felt this breeze blowing off the river. You know what it felt like? It felt like hope. I could see the sun setting over the city. And I looked up at Joe and I said, Hey, Joe. I think it's about time for the ball game to begin. Is this the way to the stadium? I got to get my daughter a t-shirt. And I think I'm going to get one for you too. Joe just let out this laugh, that laugh, that laugh. It was music to my ears. Music to my ears. Let those who have ears to hear listen. Listen. 
And for today, that's the good news. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you pray with me? Lord, sometimes our ears are blocked. Sometimes it's like our ears have fallen off and we've just chosen not to hear. Lord Jesus, by the power of your stories, your parables, help us to hear your truth, to hear your voice, to struggle with these words, to live them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody breathe. Everybody take a picture. You're not going to see me in a suit again. (laughs) Ain't going to happen.